Hi. This is where we talk about geopolitics for 20 minutes, but it's quite important. It's about establishing a new world order, and trade wars are happening, which is going to start. I'm David Rowan. I am hosting a secret new podcast, which we haven't yet announced, with the Web Summit team, where we go on walks with founders. Michael Pillsbury, at the end of the sofa, is a China expert at the Hudson Institute in Washington, D.C., and Donald Trump has called him a leading authority on America and China. And next to him is Juan Branco, who has written a best-selling book. He's a lawyer who's worked with the Gilets Jaunes, with WikiLeaks. And we're going to look at where we are now. There's a short-term trade war between the US and China, but we're also going to look at the wider implications. Michael, yes. how worried, concerned should we be at these tariffs that keep getting introduced between Washington and Beijing? Who can be the winner? Well, the Chinese like to say win-win for both sides, but the Americans suspect that means one win for China and then another win for China. So both sides can win. Global economic growth is being affected by the tariff war. And we almost had a deal last year in May. The administration keeps the details secret, so do the Chinese. But it was 150 pages long. It involved an office being set up in Beijing by us and an office in Washington by China that would be able to punish violations of intellectual property theft or other things. The Chinese, uh, at the last minute, apparently because of hardliners in Beijing, they blocked the agreement. So since last May, the effort has been to put this back together, and the Chinese position is very clear. They want all tariffs removed or they won't give anything. And the American position is just the opposite. The tariffs will stay on, and you must earn your way out by good conduct. So I'm very concerned about the future of a global economic growth. The IMF has already estimated about a half of 1% or more will be uh, cut from global economic growth next year. And the trade wars could, in fact, get worse. The tariffs could be placed much higher than they are now. And you have expressed your own concerns about China's motivations. You had a best-selling book yourself, and the title may give away where you stand. <laughs> the 100-year marathon, China's secret strategy to replace America as the global superpower. What do you think China's end game is? Well, China is very concerned by one word that I could teach everybody here to say. So you can say you learned a word of Chinese today. It's in the fourth tone. It means a following kind of sharp tone. Everybody could say it. The word is ba. Ba. A ba is a hegemon or a tyrant who controls the world. And China sees America as a bad ba. So the Chinese New World Order, the most important thing about the world order China wants is no more ba. The American side thinks that the ba is kind of a heavy burden. It's been quite difficult to establish the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the United Nations. This whole structure we call the world order had a lot to do with American initiative after World War II. The Chinese want to make this what they call a more just world order. They'll keep parts of it, but other parts will be invented. This is also affecting the trade talks because the Chinese side does not want the trade talks to be won by the old ba. And when, when America says China wants to be the ba, you want to replace us, this makes the Chinese very angry. So we ask them why. You could be the largest economy in the world. You could be twice as big as America. What's wrong with that for you Chinese? They say, well, ba means tyrant, ruthless, no virtue. We will be a much better kind of bah than you Americans were. So you see this as an existential battle 
for global dominance? I'd prefer if you use the word ba. <laughs> Who will be the ba? Juan Branco, you represent people who have been affected by global trade, the workers, people whose organizations are being challenged by the dominance of big corporations. You've worked for refugees in bringing legal actions against the European Union. Um, how concerned are you that free trade is being inhibited? Well, first I would like to thank uh, the Web Summit for reminding us that Tony Blair is free of movement. He was here a few hours ago, instead of, in spite of having triggered a deadly war in Iraq, who has costed tens of thousands of people alive, and that in the same time, <laughs> Julian Assange is still in prison in London for having revealed the crimes committed by the US and the UK. I'm not used to be surrounded by so many war criminals, so it's kind of a, <laughs> a, new, a new setup for me. But uh, regarding the, and I, actually my thanks to the Web Summit are sincere in the sense that it allows really to show that Tony Blair is free of movement. And it's good to, be, to see it and not just to forget about that. And it allows to show that Julian is not present here whilst I think many of you would like to hear his thoughts about these subjects. He has worked a lot on commercial trade, revealing the secret commercial agreements, the CETA and so forth, uh, and showing how they were secretly negotiated in order to favor a certain number of interests and of course go against many others. And yes, I've defended many people in France, yellow jackets who have seen their lives destroyed because there was an ideology which was not sustained by fact on trade, on free trade, on the freedom of trade, which was supposed to bring a greater good at some point for humanity, but that in the meantime, meantime sorry, could destroy the planet, could destroy thousands of lives that could not be taken back to where they were before, and that this was only perceived at an, econ at an economic perspective. So a life from an economic perspective is something that will be substituted at some point because you will get a new kid raised and he will replace the person who has been destroyed. And so, I mean, you can destroy lives for generations. Uh, Schumpeter described that and nothing will happen from a statistic perspective. It's not the case in reality, of course. And defending those people has been very important to open the eyes regarding this situation. And I mean, Macron had prepared a helicopter to fly away uh, his palace uh, at the beginning of December because there was such an anger in France against these elites which were completely indifferent to the consequences of their decisions that they were ready to invest the Elysium. And still Macron is today in China negotiating to open a more even, even more the borders in a commercial way with China, between China and France, and he's pushing and he has stated it publicly, especially to have more pork, French pork being sold to China, 10,000 kilometers away. I mean, one of the main goals today of a president that pretends to be modern, to pretend to be ecological, is to try to have pork being done in France, raised in France, then put in a condition that will be able to travel 10,000 kilometers and sold to Chinese people. It makes literally no sense. And this absurdity, this complete absurdity and disconnection of these individuals who are leading us today, who are pushing us to an abyss because it's destroying the planet and destroying the individuals who are today trying to struggle for life. I mean, I mean, I think it's very well exemplified by this current situation and the fact that they do not realize, I don't, I don't even understand how Macron, while seeing Xi Jinping, doesn't ask himself when he starts talking about pork, but how can I think of bringing French pork to China? What's the meaning of this? How, what, what, how did I make a, of this not only a goal in my negotiations, but also how did I do public statements to show how important uh, what I was doing was for the French people. Uh, how disconnected they can be, I don't know. What I know is that these tensions which are created by this world order which is falling apart will 
probably trigger extremely harsh consequences. And it's very, hard, very easy. I saw Tony Blair again speaking about populism and complaining about populism. Pop I don't know what populism is. I just know that there is a rage that is rising. And of course, it's not well represented here because basically the world of technology is benefiting massively from a financial perspective, but I don't think from an ethical, nor even in terms of inventivity perspective of this globalization. But you have millions of people who are being basically enslaved or used as consumers of these products that are imposed to them. Far from that, the around us that are being used actually to serve us, to guide us in these places, backstages to give water to the most favored, favored of us, to give us free food, free, I don't even understand why we do not pay for our food, why it's being the most privileged. I mean, and all this system is really, I mean, you have to pay 1,500 euros to be here. Do we realize how absurd, I mean, in, in a country in which the average income is almost half of that, trade, the, of that price? And this is all, of course, set up by this globalization ideology, but which is basically destroying society. that Macron's argument would be free trade will eventually create economic prosperity, which will trickle down to the workers. No, it will just put pressure, even more pressure on, work, on, on workers, especially from countries like France, because in terms of competitivity, they will never be able to, be, to cost as little as someone who works in Bangladesh, in China, who has no social security, who has no capacity to defend his rights. So they will just be crushed by this ideology, but not only that. Again, you will crush the planet as a whole. Selling French pork in China, again, just think of what is going on here. Michael, the system. <laughs> well, no, let the applause continue. <laughs> the system is rigged against the workers and the environment, what's so bad about a new world order? Well, the workers and the environment and many issues of standards uh, are built into trade talks. Trade agreements, whether they're multilateral, like the, like the rules of the WTO, or bilateral agreements, they try to cover issues that Juan is raising. They've not been successful. And one of the biggest problems about free trade now is if you're a startup um, or you have a new idea for a new technology, one of your greatest problems now is not worker standards or bad water or pollution. It's the theft of intellectual property by China. This is the heart of the trade talks. If you have a new idea, let's say for a mobile game like uh, uh, fatal Fantasy 15, $69 billion new economy is mobile games. The Chinese immediately try to steal what makes the mobile games popular. Any field of startup technology, including old technology, is vulnerable to China. And it's probably, there are probably two reasons for Chinese economic growth over the last three decades. You know, they've averaged 10% a year. So their economy is 10 times bigger now than it was in 2001, 20 times bigger than in the beginning. One reason has been the intellectual property theft. But the other is what Juan is talking about. China now is uh, almost the most unequal society in the world. They used to have the dream of a communes and equality in China. It was called communist China for that reason. All of that was changed about 40 years ago, when China's leaders said, to get rich is glorious. And China began to leave behind the underprivileged of the country. So Donald Trump seems to listen to what you say. What would you advise him now to do as he gets deeper and deeper into a tariff-led trade war? Well, President Trump first wrote about China as a challenge in a book 20 years ago. He said it will be the, the number one challenge America faces in the world. And he meant in terms of economics, trade, technology, he deeply admires the Chinese people. So his idea is how can we increase trade between the U.S. and China? These two great economies, we're $21 trillion now in GDP. China's about $15 trillion. So all other countries in the world, even together, don't come close to the Chinese idea of G2. These two countries basically run the world. That's the direction we're going. And President Trump's trade talks 
are an effort, I think will be successful, an effort to have reciprocity, to have the US and China play by the same rules, and to have a mechanism where if they catch us or we catch them doing something unfair, there'll be a mechanism to have punishment by either side. So the direction the world is going is toward this G2. Small countries are being left out, and it's too bad. Juan, let's just say Donald Trump reads your book. You've written the powerful one critiquing President Macron. Let's say he calls you in to give him some advice. What would you suggest that he does? I, I, uh, on France? Or, uh, on the trade wars that we're going through at the moment? Okay, no, before that, I would ask him to free Julian Assange. I'm sorry to, to insist on that, uh, but he's the one who has the power for that. So if you are able to speak with him, I would like you to convey that message. There is no reason for this guy to be held in jail in seven square meters in a jail that was built for terrorism in Belgium. Back to the question. But the British, the British hold him, not No, America. no, it's for an extradition <laughs> demand from the US. So it's the US who hold him, and we know that. So, and regarding free trade, I'm, I, I mean, I'm an enemy as a French person of, of the power of Donald Trump today, because of course he's trying, as you said yourself, to try to create a, a G2 that will impose its rule to all the other countries. And of course the only solution, if we want to avoid what I consider to be a new kind of neo-fascism in which you have protectionism abroad and very liberal rules inside your country in which you let some kind of savage cap capitalism basically destroy society, we have to think for the people who consider themselves as, as progressists as a, of a new alternative that starts by building back a sovereign space at a national or a bit larger level, but probably not in the EU, which is not capable we have, this, we have realized that after years of years of waiting to, to create that, to defend again our space, commercially speaking, to create again simply boundaries that will allow us not to get commer uh, commercial products that violate, violate environmental rules, social rules, to sanction those countries who commit those violations and stop with this kind of incredible naivety. I mean, Emmanuel Macron, appears to be a rational, serious person, modern, and, and yet he, he considers that opening the borders with China, commercially speaking, speaking, will be beneficial for France. He has no power to go against China in case China would violate the, the clauses of the negotiations that they are putting in place. There is no way that we will be able to defend ourselves by going forward in a, freedom, in a free trade movement. We have to protect ourselves again, protect the weaker of society who, has been, who have been completely forgotten these last 20 years under the excuse that in the long term it would be favorable for the general cause. We have discovered it won't be the case and the planet will not be livable if we continue that path before that moment. And we have to renew politically because this is a political subject, either through a revolution, either through the constitution of a new front, uh, an alternative to this current system. For me, Macron and Trump are very similar. So, both internally uh, sadly, we're That's not going to be able to have that revolution <laughs> true. here because we have to make way for the next session. Um, I, yeah, I just need we to say President Trump, well. President Trump does admire President Macron, so we disagree about that. <laughs> we didn't quite solve the crisis now. Thank you, Michael Pillsbury and Juan Branco. Thank you.